Welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Xi. I'm currently a sophomore at UCLA, was elected as the youngest delegate for Joe Biden, and co hosts this podcast. And I'm Jill Wine Banks, the author of The Watergate Girl and The Wearer of Jill's Pins. And today, in honor of our guest, David French, I am wearing a flag, which I normally consider to be a trite kind of message pin. But because I'm hoping that we can once again have a United States of America, I'm wearing that. David French is a senior editor of The Dispatch and a columnist for The Atlantic. He also is an Iraq War veteran and the author of Divided We Fall, America's Succession, Threat, and How to Restore Our Nation as well as the co-host of the Advisory Opinions podcast and host of Good Faith podcast. He is a traditional conservative and an outspoken critic of Donald Trump at the same time. I'm very excited about having him as a guest, and I know that you are going to find this conversation enlightening. As I said, we're going to be talking today about the polarization in America and my hope for a United States of America I hope that we can get back to the union, that our union will survive the current polarization in our country. Our country has always been divided on political issues, but we have never experienced the degree of polarization that we are seeing now. A poll conducted this summer found nearly two-thirds of Southern Republican states would back secession. Another poll from November of 2021 found 68% of Republicans believe the election was stolen. These are very scary numbers, numbers that indicate a grim future for both truth and the survival of democracy in America in the 21st century. Is there any hope left for unity in America? Can the Republican Party return to a time when facts mattered and it wasn't just a Trump cult? Thank you so much, David, for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. So you're known as a traditional conservative and as one of former President Trump's most outspoken critics. I'm wondering first, what does it mean to be a traditional conservative right now? Uh, Right now? (laughs) That's a really good question. Uh, what it means is to be on the outside of the right in to a large degree. I, mm-hmm. I've even started to really draw distinctions between conservatism and the right because they are not synonymous any longer. Uh, it used to be that there was a broad kind of ideological consensus on the right that was rooted in sort of Reagan conservatism, rooted in an idea called fusionism that predated Reagan, but really came into its, it came into power in the era of Reagan. And this is a, um, a, a kind of a combination of three strands. It's called a three-legged stool. And one of the stools was a push towards more limited government. It wasn't purely libertarian to where, you know, no government, of course, but more, if you're going to put the thumb on the scales, it's more towards limited government. It was also sh- social conservative. And it was also in favor of a robust American uh, military and a forward and critically robust American global alliances. So this is the architecture of sort of the American policy that brought about the end of the Cold War, uh, for example. And for a long time, if you were going to be, quote unquote, in the conservative movement, there was room for a lot of disagreement. How limited should government be? How much should you focus on social conservative conservatism? How, what should military strategy be? There, and what should the defense budget be? Lots of room for debate, but that was, those were the broad parameters. And no longer are those considered to be sort of the, the, the ideological guardrails of the right. Um, limited government is largely, that very idea is largely scorned. Um, it's much more moving towards a big government uh, model. Central planning kind of economic model is something that's gaining some fashion on the right. A retreat from global engagements. And a social conservatism that is still a social conservatism, but very, very, very focused on culture war and not just culture war on traditional culture war issues. So for example, if you had told a member of a conservative movement in 20, oh, I don't know, 2019, that vaccines or masks would be a part of a culture war in the United States coming f- you know, from the right, uh, he would have thought you were nuts, that mm-hmm. that's not possible. So what you have is 
the right is really moving in a different direction ideologically. It's also moving in a different direction temperamentally. There is no, no longer an emphasis on character. There's mm-hmm. much more an emphasis on combativeness. Um, and so the right is really shifting in some fundamental ways away from what was sort of the conservatism of the modern era. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious because on behalf of younger Republicans who have only seen uh, the GOP with Trump as its leader and known the GOP as a party that held, had no agenda and will not participate in presidential debates, I'm wondering what <laughs> you might tell them about how, I guess, this GOP fits with your description of conservatism. Yeah. You know, one of the things I think it's important to understand is that this GOP actually below the Trump level is still relatively split. So there are a lot of vestiges and a lot of uh, remnants of the more traditional conservatism, especially at the state level, especially amongst governors. Not all governors. Ron DeSantis has really moved fully into sort of that new right camp. (laughs) But many other governors are much more, and many other state legislators are much more in the, um, still in that more traditional conservative frame, although they still have supported Trump as a preferable alternative in their minds to the Democrats. So the unanimity of the, of the right behind Trump uh, conceals a lot of division within the right, the larger right. And so if you're a young person Unless you really dive into the new right, um, and you're if you're young and you're conservative, unless you really are diving in with both feet into the new right, you're going to be exposed to a broad spectrum of debate still between conservatives and the new right. This is something that is constantly lighting up Twitter. It's constantly lighting up conservative publications and new right publications. I mean, this is a battle that you really kind of have to ha- bury your head into a cocoon to not be aware of. And it's very mm-hmm. uh, aggressive. In many ways, it's even less civil than the battle between the right and the left. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and But it's very much alive, and it's alive sort of from top to bottom within the right side of the American political spectrum. That is really fascinating. And um, we want to get into that more uh, in, later in the podcast, but I first want to ask you, you know, you've watched as many Republicans in office have stayed silent about Trump. Um, I'm wondering first if you can explain their silence and why don't you think more people speak out against Trump and defend what you describe as traditional conservative values? Yeah, it's a a pretty, there's an easy answer to this and a more complex answer to this. The easy answer is that it's um, very difficult to squarely take on Trump. Um, It is something, one of the aspects of his movement is he has collected around him um, a group of of really dangerous zealots. And Mm -hmm. so if you're going to publicly confront Trump and you have any kind of public platform at all, uh, there's a high likelihood you're going to face threats. There's a high likelihood or there's a likelihood or a possibility that they, uh, those threats will um, spill over into perhaps people showing up at your house. Um, there is just a, a, people will try to end your career. There is just an extraordinary level of pressure that is applied to, um, support Trump and the list of, uh, Republican officials, Republican, um, commentators who've opposed Trump and who faced a, frankly, a terrifying backlash is, is very long at this point. So there are a lot of kind of personal incentives that people have to try to just kind of wait it out. Um, you know, not everybody wants to face backlashes that include death threats, that can include people showing up at your home, that can include cyber harassment or efforts to end your career. So that's the sort of the easy answer. It's just uh, it's an, ap- an intimidating atmosphere that's been created. The harder answer is that. There's a lot of disagreement about the right tactics to sort of end the age of Trump. So my uh, friend Eric Erickson wrote a piece today that says, hey, everyone ignore him. Just ignore him. You know, people will move on. And, uh, you know, he might be right. You know, he might be right. But at the same time, um, That was one of the strategies in 2015 and 2016 was just to sort of think that he's going to fade. And for a long time, there have been people who've really been saying he's just going to fade. He's going to wear out his welcome. 
And they, they might be right that he will fade and wear out his welcome, but it hasn't been correct yet. <laughs> and, and so there's a real, so a lot of this, you'll have people who really don't like his influence in the party, who have legitimate, good faith, tactical differences on how you minimize his influence. And one of the genuine good faith answers to that is, well, you minimize him by ignoring him in the hopes that, you know, he begins to lose momentum because he thrives on on that kind of combat. And I, I remember all the way back in 2015 writing, look, you, you can't do that. If you want to oppose him, if you want him to go away, you have to oppose him. You have to take him on. And so that's been a disagreement, I think, for people who want to see a post-Trump Republican Party for a long time. It's, does he go away if you kind of deny him the limelight? Is it even possible to deny him the limelight? Uh, and and so that there's there's a real tactical question that a lot of people have about how best to deal with Trump, even amongst people who want who genuinely genuinely want to see a post Trump um, Republican Party and conservative movement. It seems to me that you have fallen on the side of take him on, and you've been outspoken. Yes. <laughs> so has that caused you to have some of these responses from? either former colleagues or from people who would otherwise fall within uh, an interest area of reading your conservative viewpoints? Oh, it's been an unbelievably difficult experience, uh, really beginning in the summer of 2015. Um, racist attacks directed at uh, my youngest daughter, um, mm -hmm. who's adopted, um, including things like photoshopping her face into gas chambers and um, putting that picture on Twitter with a, a Photoshop picture of Donald Trump in an SS uniform pushing the button, uh, the gas button, to direct threats, bomb, uh, you know, FBI contacting us because the Trump superfan bomber Cesar Sayak um, had looked for our home address, uh, cyber harassment efforts to quote unquote cancel me. Um, just a remarkable uh, parade of acts of harassment and threats and attempted intimidation has really been going on uh, since 2015. And even to this day, you know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll receive word that I've been doxxed uh, by, you know, white nationalists on 4chan and you know, so this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. This is not something that p normal people want to endure. Um, and uh, to be honest, it's not something that I thought we would encounter when I first, in the summer of 2015, objected to um, some of the rhetoric I was seeing on the right. I did not expect this kind of ferocious backlash, but I felt like I was kind of a canary in the cold mine, a canary in the cold mine of... This is what the hard edge, not everyone, of course, in the new right, but this is what mm -hmm. the hard edge of the new right was. And um, and so then I started to try to raise the alarm and raise the alarm. And then person after person after person after person began to experience something similar to the point where I've talked to, you know, I've talked to friends who've had to have law enforcement protection for sometimes weeks and months. That is a terrifying scene, obviously. And, you know, as someone watching this, I see the Republican Party or what was known and is still known and called the Republican Party as really being a cult of followers of one person uh, who doesn't, you mentioned ideology, but I'm not sure I could identify his ideology except to stay in power, maybe. And right. I, I wonder how did Trump get such power? And could it, if more people had joined you in 2015, or if the Republicans had had the courage to vote to impeach on either of the two impeachments, if he would have been denied enough power that we wouldn't be threatened now by the big lie and the threat to democracy that that poses, uh, the forged documents of electors, is there something that could have been done when you first acted in 2015? Yeah, you know, there were multiple points where Trump was on the ropes. I mean, there's just no question about that. So if you go back to early 2016, um, when Trump had lost Iowa, 
Yeah. And then he was going into New Hampshire, and yeah, he was going to win New Hampshire. But at that point in time, Marco Rubio was really exactly where he wanted to be. He had finished strong in New Hampshire. I mean, in Iowa, he was arcing upwards in New Hampshire. It was far from a foregone conclusion that Trump was going to be the nominee. And then there was that memorable moment where Chris Christie just demolished Rubio, just demolished him in a debate. And that was a, you know, I honestly believe that was a hinge point. Then another very obvious hinge point was after the Access Hollywood tape, Trump was bleeding support. And then came the Comey letter after, you know, emails were found, um, you know, more more Hillary Clinton emails were found. And so, you know, what you ended up having in this dynamic of 2016 was you had the two least liked major politicians in the United States of America by favorability polling were battling each other for the presidency. And it was sort of whose scandal would be the last one Mm. (laughs) that was going to dictate who was going to win. And, you know, um, I remember when the Comey letter came out, and uh, I remember at that moment, I had this unmistakable feeling that that is a hinge moment in this in this presidential in the presidential contest, and I but I don't think I don't think there was a hinge moment after that until until the actual election itself when Biden won. I think that once Trump won, there were no set of facts, and when Trump won, it bound him emotionally to the Republican base. Because they were all going into Election Day in 2016 thinking they were going to get four years of Hillary Clinton after eight years of Barack Obama with this feeling of just complete despair. I mean, I know I'm, I, I was living in the heart of Trump country. I mean, my precinct voted for Trump by almost 50 points. Um, <laughs> so that's all my neighbors. Everyone was in total despair that Hillary was going to win. And then Trump shocks the world. And I saw the emotional bond begin to be forged right then and there. So an awful lot of people who'd held their nose by the morning of, you know, um, the morning after that election, they were all in for Trump because he had, against all odds, rescued them from Hillary Clinton. And nothing, honestly, was going to shake that support. And and I have good friends who say, you know, wait, if the day, if the night of or the day after January 6th, uh, they had voted on impeachment and then held a summary trial on the Senate in like January 8th or 9th, you might have impeached him. Mm. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, You know, they think that 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 time interval between the January 6th and the actual impeachment trial really allowed Mm. Trump to reconsolidate his support. But I could see the recon, I could see the consolidation of his support on the night of January 6th itself as friends of mine on social media would, who had been silent for four years, would raise an objection to what happened on the 6th and then immediately get attacked and swarmed Wow! by Trump supporters online, immediately. And so um, I think any effort that to, that would have, there was no way in my view, a critical mass of Republicans were going to coalesce to impeach Trump at any point. And some of the other favorability polling bears that out. Um, Mike Pence and and uh, Senator and Mitch McConnell, their favorability plunged like off a oh. cliff after mm-hmm. January sixth, and Trump's remained sky high amongst Republicans. So that tells you about the level of the bond. So I think the key moments to stop Trump were all in 2015 and 2016, and once he won, that bond with the base was was incredibly tight. Well, that is terrifying because that means that. It still exists. I I clearly remember, particularly the Comey statement, and I had been campaigning in Iowa, and I know that Democrats were waiting for the last scandal. And as soon as that happened, I knew it was over, at least in Iowa. Um, And so we are where we are today because Republicans who have a brain are not speaking up. They aren't rebelling. If, if they are, in fact, a majority of the party, why can't they take back control of the GOP? Well, you know, here's the interesting thing. The Republican Party is changing. So um, 
one of the, th- the one of the reasons why you saw um, one of the reasons why you saw Trump lose in in twenty twenty was the suburb. It wasn't the, the cities, as he was saying. Mm-hmm. You know, he kept saying, "Well, you know that the Democrats are using the machines in the cities to take me out." Well, the the votes in the cities wasn't really out of line with historical norms. In in some cities, it was actually narrower. I mean, slightly narrower. Uh, in Trump's favor than it had been four years before. No, what you saw was a a real ch- a realignment in some ways in the suburbs. And so there's a category of voter who had voted Republican previously, and they just don't really consider themselves Republican anymore. Uh, and then there's a category of voters who hadn't really been political before or hadn't really considered themselves Republican before, and now they're all in and part of the Republican base for Trump. So it's not the same universe of people. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the that's one thing that I think is really important to understand. And it's interesting, you know, I see it even in my own community. In my own community, there are some people who are still in that Republican base, who've been in the Republican base for a while. But there's also a lot of people who are part of that core Republican base who weren't really involved in politics very much before Mm -hmm. now. And many of them have the loudest voices. And so um, what you see writ large at the the, um, national level is replicating itself at the local level up and down the line. And so what ends up happening is you don't have to be a senator or a congressman or a, a pundit with a national platform to face this sort of ferocious and hellacious backlash. Um, you can be anybody uh, at any level. And I've compared it to sort of being like, like shocked with a social media cattle prod. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's at any time <laughs> up and down the line, you really try to take these folks on, you get shocked with that social media cattle prod. You get a those very direct and and vicious attacks. And so what you're beginning to see is a real disengagement from the people who are very focused on politics and the people who are much less focused. And and the people who are much less focused are still quite reasonable. <laughs> um, but they're just not in it in the day-to-day. They're just not they're not in the trenches in the same way like the the base is. Do you think the Republican Party will become two different parties, those who are Trump people um, and those who still believe in what you have defined as the core traditional conservative viewpoints of limited government um, and facts? Let's, uh, you know, we got to get to facts yeah. because one of the right. reasons they use a cattle prod is because they don't have facts. And if you challenge them on, tell me what's better. They can't. If you say, tell me what the evidence is that there was fraud, there was none. It's clear there was none. If there was fraud, it was the electors who signed forged documents. Right. There was, That's where the fraud is. And it's the there Republicans. There was attempted fraud, all right. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it wasn't the Democrats. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with the uh, machines, either by Dominion, any other machines. They're all. Um, the Smartmatics, all perfectly fine. There was no flipping of votes. Um, it, it just leaves me wondering what there is to do to rein this in and to get facts to the people who need to have facts. Well, you know, the, 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 there's some challenges here that are just super practical. So one challenge that's just super practical is so long as the defining characteristic of our politics is negative partisanship, you're probably not going to see a big split in the GOP. And negative partisanship means that what really ultimately motivates you isn't the ideology of your Mm -hmm. party, but the opposition to the other party. Mm -hmm. So even though there are a lot of people who are very, very, very uncomfortable with Donald Trump, fewer sadly than there used to be, but they're still out there that are very uncomfortable with Donald Trump and wish that there would be somebody else that the Republican Party would nominate, they cannot fathom not voting for a Republican, mm-hmm. because not voting for a Republican means, in their mind, um, supporting Democrats, and that is absolutely, completely, yeah. totally unthinkable. So, so long as negative partisanship, this incredible, overpowering animosity, drives our political divide, 
the weakening of what of a party is seen as the strengthening of the other party, and that's the one thing you cannot do. Mm-hmm. And that's why there's such anger directed, say, at people like me, because you're literally seen as a traitor. You're literally mm-hmm. seen mm-hmm. as a Benedict Arnold, somebody who is empowering the rise of the enemies of the United States of America. And that's literally the language yeah. um, that's used out there. So... So, you know, the, that's why people are not in the Republican world, can look in the Republican world, and it looks to the outside like a very united front, because it is when it comes to the posture towards Democrats. Right. It's not when it comes to how they think of themselves internally. And so that that's one thing. And then the other thing is, it's really important, I think, for people to look at information flow. And... If you there's a there's a website that tracks the top twenty um, right leaning websites on the internet, and the first thing you'll notice right off the top is that Fox News, not just in broadcast but online, is dominant. Mm-hmm. It is so big that you have to add up like the next ten, twelve, fourteen, or fifteen websites wow. to wow. even get to Fox's presence online, wow. and then. If you look at the next 15, 20 websites underneath Fox, some of them, a couple of them, two or three of them are solid and good and are, you know, thoughtful and engage, you know, with the real world. But a dozen or more of them are cesspools of conspiracy. And so one of the first things that you do when you're talking to somebody who's deeply um, embedded in right-wing media is you have to understand that they live in a world in which, I'll just put it this way. I was um, at church and this very sweet older lady at church came up and and asked me, David, and people would do this all the time, especially early in the Trump presidency, why don't you support our president? And I, I would come up with like a short answer, but, you know, a different reason here and there. But one of them was, I just want a president who lies less. And and she looked at me and with absolute sincerity said, Donald Trump lies? And but if all you just you know, yeah. if all you do is tune in to um right wing talk radio or Fox mm-hmm. Primetime, yeah. you're not gonna do Donald Trump lies because they're gonna always amplify every single lie or overreaction from the left. And you're going to know, you're going to know chapter and verse of every lie that you've seen from the left or every overreaction that you've seen from the left or every extremist you see yeah. from the left. That You know that chapter and verse, but you will have no knowledge of the case against Donald Trump. Yeah. Just no knowledge. You know, I think that's why your work at The Dispatch is so critical. And in that same vein, last week you wrote a piece for um, The Atlantic titled How the Rights Rules of Rhetoric Create Racial Provocateurs. Um, and that's an article our listeners and viewers can find a link in the show notes. Um, we dived into the distinction between right wing and conservatism earlier on, and you made that point early on in the piece. Um, I'm wondering if you, just, you can just give an example to our audience of who falls under that right wing camp and who falls under that conservatism camp. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, if you're going to talk about the right wing camp, you're going to talk about much more sort of the Sean Hannity, the Tucker Carlson's, the constellation of infotainment celebrities in talk radio, not all of them, but Mm -hmm. many, if not most of them. Um, politically, you're going to be talking about the performance artists like the Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Matt Gateses, <laughs> increasingly Ron Johnson, um, Gosar, Ted Cruz, who ironically enough sort of tried to get his start as a quote unquote constitutional conservatives, con- constitutional conser- conservative, and now as a right wing pugilist fundamentally. Um, and so you can go on, but these are folks who. They might have differing ideologies. Uh, if you really drill down, what's your preferred tax rate? What's your preferred posture towards NATO? But that's all secondary to sort of this fundamental identity, which is, for lack of a better term, just anti-left. It's just fundamentally anti-left. And so 
that's why if you're going to listen to right wing radio, if you're going to listen to, if you're going to be on, uh, if you're going to be on Fox Prime Time, it's just a never ending yeah. stream of alleged left wing outrages, and so that's why you can see why then millions upon millions of people put an absolute premium on fighting on fighting because these left wing outrages are seen to be um so fundamentally threatening to the very existence of the United States of America I'll never forget um debating Eric Metaxas this prominent evangelical uh, uh before the election and he literally believed or at least said he believed that the um entire nation will fall will fall if Joe Biden wins. And, you know, this is the kind of rhetoric Dan Bongino describes insane leftists as people who wish death on me and everyone else from COVID because they're legitimately crazy, satanic demon people. Like, that's what you have to understand the rhetoric is like, and it's just flooding out there. And so that's that's when when I mean right wing, whereas I grew up in a conservative movement that was engaged in deep scholarship on the original meaning of the Constitution. We would host events when I was in law school where Jack Kemp would come and he would speak about reaching out to marginalized communities in the United States through innovative economic policies. And we'd sit and we'd talk about these economic policies for two hours. Then I would go to a debate, um, and a packed house debate between two scholars of the Soviet Union and uh, talking about you know the era of mutually assured destruction and what is in nuclear policy and so this was I grew up in a world of conservative ideas that was very alive with debate and very alive with innovation and now you know it's memes about the squad and that's just something fundamentally different. So in the same way that the Senate that Joe Biden hoped would be bipartisan again doesn't exist anymore. Neither does the debate that needs to be had on ideas. Um, and and I, I want to follow up more about the rhetoric that you're talking about. But first, I, I, listening to you, I just want to know, how can facts get through this silo of Fox News tells you the lies about the Democrats and lies about Donald Trump by saying he's not lying? How <laughs> how can you control Fox News or how can you get the people who only tune in to that to hear what's I mean, real? You, you can't really. I mean, you, let me put it this way. There is no sort of set of policies that you can enact, certainly that are consistent with the Constitution, where you sort of get a grip on this phenomenon. Um, and I think it's much more, to be quite honest, what and I wrote a piece about this in my Atlantic newsletter that the reality is that Trump's base is both his greatest strength and potentially his fatal political weakness. And and what I mean by that is this his core base is so, for lack of a better term, spiteful and unpleasant and often malicious and cruel that. They lay waste even to ostensible allies in interpersonal relationships until you're in complete agreement with them. Hmm. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of regular folks are sick of that. They're sick of it. Now, a lot of them are sick of it and don't say anything. But the bottom line is you have a lot of families in Red America who are divided and and they're still Republican. I mean, they're still they're still gonna press the button for a, a Republican. But it's it's difficult to really describe the dynamic in the sense that, you know, almost every family you know, somebody's got an uncle or an aunt or a niece or a nephew or a grandmother or grandfather, mother or father, who has snapped. They've just snapped. And they're all in on Stop the Steal. They're all in on, on anti-vax. And it's causing deep problems in the family. It's causing relational issues. And, you know... There are a lot of people who want to turn the page from this era. They're desperate for a return to some degree of of normalcy. Um, and so I think a lot of this is happening sort of family by family, person by person. Uh, but the problem is, is there's no real infrastructure 
or leadership to where the people who are disaffected within the right mm -hmm. can lock on to. Because every single person who rises up gets attacked viciously. And so Liz Cheney, she was, you know, she supported yeah. Trump through the 2020 election. And then she says, hey, we got to get to the bottom of January 6th. Trump's got to go. This is way over the top. And then does Trump lose support? No. Does Liz Cheney lose support? Yes. And and so this these individual politicians or even small groups of politicians that stand up to Trump, they so are they are so consistently demolished that you you know, it's really hard to see sort of systemically how change will occur. But when I look individually, family by family, I see a level of tension and a level of conflict that's really kind of unsustainable over the long run. It just seems to me you have to have a majority of the party speaking up, a mass that might make a difference. Yeah. But let's look at um, going to your idea of this rhetoric and the people you've described as being that right, not conservative. Um, you wrote, as a result, much of the new right operates under a set of rhetorical rules of engagement that become particularly toxic when applied to race. And I want to probe that rhetorical toxicity. Um, and I wonder if it's because the words accurately reflect the racial views and intolerance of the new GOP and whether they're intended to be provocative and appeal to the base because that's what the base actually believes. <laughs> well, you know, there is no question that there are people within the base within the base who are there are people within the base who harbor deeply reactionary racial views and there are outright racists within the base. I think that's a, if you're going to talk about sort of people who are what you would categorize as uh, just outright racist, though, that's still a real minority in the coalition. I think the, the larger critical mass of people are, are those folks who you might want to, they say that they're sort of their driving purpose is that they're anti woke. Uh, so they're anti woke. That's sort of the driving. And that's a hugely powerful cultural force right now. Um, I was talking to somebody very smart uh, who's very sm one of the smartest observers of the conservative movement in the United States. And he said he has never seen grassroots intensity in his entire career, not even pro-life grassroots intensity, comparable to the anti-woke intensity. Mm. And so that anti-woke um, movement although it takes aim at some things that are legitimate excesses, is so primed to reject any kind of introspection on the basis of race and so primed to accept anyone who raises an anti-woke banner mm -hmm. that what ends up happening is they find themselves time and time and time again elevating some really toxic people. And, and so long as the toxic person um, cloaks themselves in this anti-woke banner, then they, they will excuse a multitude of sins, and they'll try to reinterpret words that have just really uh, deeply um, repugnant meanings in the most favorable light possible, because, you know, the rule, the rule is you have to hit the left— and if you're going to critique the right, you can't do it publicly. At, at best, it's got to be private or not at all. And so, um, so what ends up happening is you just see this pattern arise time and time again where somebody who is quote-unquote anti-woke is elevated, and then that person keeps speaking and keeps speaking, and maybe they were radical all along, or maybe they radicalize themselves the more they immerse in this movement, and then they cross a tipping point and yet they're still embraced. They're still embraced uh, because you can't give an inch to the left. You can't give an inch if you if you do if you concede anything to the left. Then you're you know again you're weak. You're a traitor. You're you're facilitating wokeness. It's it's a very 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 toxic dynamic. Can you give an example of either a word that you, that you're talking about that has taken on new meaning? 
Well, you know, I, I think, you know, I in my piece in The Atlantic, I gave a couple of examples of kinds of rhetoric that are um, just really uh, kinds of rhetoric that are, are really not just deeply toxic, but have pr- profound meaning that's deeply uh, problematic to a pluralistic country. So, for example, you know, this con- this harping that, that Tucker Carlson does on the alleged, quote, replacement of voters um, by more, quote, obedient voters from the third world. Um, and then, you know, and then to say, oh, how dare you say that anything about this is race, you know? Or, uh, so he's the most popular talk radio host, I mean, the most popular primetime cable host in America. And then you have a sort of a niche intellectual like Amy Wax from um, University of Pennsylvania Law School. And she just flat out says we need less Asian immigration until Asians don't vote Democratic as much. Or our cultural affinity immigration will mean more whites, should mean more whites than non-whites, just, but not because of racism, you see, but because of culture, which, you know, <laughs> I did, a, I did a, a piece a couple of years ago that took a look at this cultural argument. Mm-hmm. Just to say, because people are saying, no, David, if you say that's race, I'm going to tune you out because everybody on the left says everyone on the right is a racist. So if you use the R word, I'm going to tune you out. And so I just said, okay, well, let's just look at the argument on its merits. Is it actually the case that Europeans have more cultural affinity to the United States of America than immigrants from South America, from Africa, from Asia? And the answer is No. The answer is no, and, espe- and, one vi- and especially on one very, 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 very important measure of cultural affinity in the United States, Europe is a post-Christian society. Its level of religiosity is orders of magnitude lower than the United States of America. So if you're talking about people who come to this country who share the religious point of view of a majority of citizens of the United States, because a majority of Americans mm-hmm. still categorize themselves as Christians, then you're talking about immigration from, guess what? The third world. <laughs> you're talking about immigration from the very countries that these individuals say are culturally toxic to the U.S. And said, uh, and so that's the, you know, on just on the merits of the argument, mm-hmm. they're just completely wrong. In fact, you know, one of the big surprises of 2020 was the huge inroads in key parts of the country that the GOP GOP made with Hispanic voters. And so um, this is a, you know, so they're making these arguments and casting them as political or cultural. But if you dive into the politics or the cultural part of it, their argument collapses. So what are you left with? What are you left with? Yeah. Is there an antidote to this? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you know, faithful, patient, persistent argument, um, c- personal courage, not just in um, polit- politicians or pundits, but also in parents, um, grandparents, sons, daughters, in engaging in um, engaging in families, engaging in in a school, engaging in uh, you know, Young conservative clubs or or um, GOP student chapters. I mean, it's this is something that's going to be person by person, group by group, and there is no sort of political. No, there's no sort of apparent political savior waiting in the wings. You know, when when um, the Nixon era ended and Gerald Ford lost in '76. There was pretty much an heir apparent out there who was very different from Richard Nixon, and it was Ronald Reagan. Um, And so what we're dealing with, though, is something akin to imagine the Nixon era ends, but the GOP does not want to move on from Nixon. It just doesn't. And that's that's where we are right now. And the, the, the reality is that you don't, there isn't, nobody has the three-point plan to do something about this. Um, there's 17 different three-point plans, <laughs> <laughs> and, and nobody's really got a real consensus about it. And then there's also the reality is there's sort of a lack of will to go through what you have to go through to do something about mm-hmm. this. And, 
And the and you know, even if you're a very partisan Democrat, America needs two healthy parties. It really does. Yeah. I mean, there's just no record in American history of permanent control by one party. If the voters are are unhappy with the way things are, they're gonna go somewhere else. And so for the sake of the country, we have to have two healthy political parties. And we've talked about Republicans. I've got my my beefs with the Democrats. But right now it's in the national interest that we we need to have a healthy alternative party. Um, and at this point, we just flat out don't. So on that note, with the amount of polarization that our country is experiencing, I want to ask you about something that you've also written in your newsletters and in your book, Divided We Fall. Um, It's a great book, and I think because this podcast is intergenerational, hopefully one that all generations will read. Um, If I read it correctly, the premise of the book, kind of the macro level premise of the book, is that the polarization is becoming so extreme that we're on the verge of disunion. Um, Is that right, first of all? Uh, on the verge, it might be overstating it, but saying that we're headed in that direction. Mm-hmm. At some, the, the, the basic thesis is there is no truly important social, cultural, political, or religious movement that's pulling Americans together more than, they're pushing us, pu- than it's pushing us apart. So every major macro trend in the United States is pushing these two camps apart uh, from the big sort where people are increasingly living with like-minded people people, Mm -hmm. to the group polarization, which means when you live and interact with like-minded people, you tend to become more extreme yourself, to even our entertainment and viewing habits. It's really fascinating. After the 2016 election, the New York Times did a close look at sort of what is it that red and blue America watches on television? And it turns out very different things. So, you know, the things that you like to watch on TV, it's... You know, I put it um, when I was speaking about my book and I was doing, you know, the Zoom book tour in the height of the pandemic, I would say it's getting to the point, like, let's say you take two people, one is from um, Dothan, Alabama, one's from Brooklyn, and you put them in an elevator together and you say, talk about common interests and you can't say anything about the weather. What are their common interests going to be? What's the common touch point of culture that they're going to have? Yeah. And what's interesting is the answer is often hard to come by. Um, even if it, the, the guy from Brooklyn might try to bring up the most popular show in the entire United States of America at that time, Game of Thrones, but the guy from Dothan, Alabama, probably hadn't seen one second of it. Not one second of it. And so... Whereas the guy from Brooklyn might be able to speak Dothraki. <laughs> He's watched so much of it. Um, and so there's just a, um, a, and then that leads to, we don't, we often don't even have a common language. Words mean different things in different communities now. And so what ends up happening is it puts an unbelievable amount of tension and an unbelievable amount of animosity and fewer and fewer points of commonality And then when you have that combined with geographic clustering, it means it creates a real possibility of fracture, not right away. I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm not even talking about, you know, 2024 or whatever. But I think we saw on January 6th that had Mike Pence said yes to Donald Trump's plan, we would have faced the most profound constitutional crisis since 1861. Is that one of the most surprising things that you found about the degree of polarization our country faces right now? Um, You know, I think the thing that keeps surprising me is the level of raw animosity. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that, that's the thing that keeps surprising me. So um, there's even this phenomenon, I talked about it a bit in the book, and we've, there's been more research about it that's called lethal mass polarization. And what lethal mass polarization means is people who will express, um, you know, not, not all the people who, who, not people go and commit mass murder, but at least express some sort of extreme indifference for the humanity of their political opponents. And about 20% of Americans, and this is not something confined just to the right, by the way, about 20% of Americans ascribe dehumanizing characteristics to their opponents. Um, Similar percentages would believe, believe that the country might be better off if a large number of their opponents just died, just died. Um, You see... And, you know, you you see really frightening, uh, in some ways, polling results about 
the le- the extent of belief in uh, extreme or totalitarian measures that might be um, a, that might be utilized against political opponents. And again, this is a bipartisan phenomenon. Uh, and you know, one recent poll had fifty two percent of Republicans supporting separation of the United States and forty percent of Democrats. Those are very alarming numbers. Now, it's we all know it's totally one thing to say, "Oh yeah, I'm mad enough." California should secede or Texas should secede and that becoming reality. But what I I compare it to, um, what you have is it's like you have a bonfire and you've got a lot of kindling, you've got lighter fluid on it. And, you know, all that's awaiting is the right, sort of the right kind of spark and the right kind of play in the right place. And the whole thing goes up. And January 6th, I think one of the things we're learning with the Stop the Steal we had no idea when we saw that crowd breach the Capitol, the extent to which there were behind the scenes efforts designed specifically to give the vice president the legal pretext to declare Donald Trump the winner yeah. in that moment. We had no idea. And so, you know, something like that, we can't go through that again. So you have laid out a terrifying set of facts, um, which I believe are true. And I believe that most of the Republican Party is at least silent. I don't know if they actually believe some of these things, but when you look at the election law changes that have been made and the turning over of the counting of the vote, so not just voter suppression, but vote suppression, um, I have to wonder it seems to me that in a way Donald Trump has let the cat out of the bag. He has uh, energized hatred and fears of many people who would never have said the things they're saying, but now think because he says it, it's okay, even though it has no basis in fact. And I'm just, I'm hoping, I mean, we're going to run out of time. Victor and I have at least twice as many questions to ask as we have already (laughs) asked. So I want to invite you back uh, to talk to us more. But maybe is there something positive we could end on, some way of saying? You know, I I just want to say I remember the days when there were debates um, and compromise and bipartisanship when uh, William Buckley and Gore Vidal had a regular debate where they agreed on the facts, and just talked right. about what are the policy implications. Is there any chance that we could ever get back to that? There is. There is because there's a hunger for it. Um, what I found in, in at the dispatch, we have succeeded in uh, an audience reach beyond our best projections mm-hmm. when we started. And one of the reasons is because we are completely shunning the clickbait model. We're completely shunning the model of the hot take. And when we engage with people, I'm conservative. When we engage with progressives, we do so with uh, mutual respect. Um, and and there are people who are hungry for that. The number one compliment that we get is, you've helped keep me sane. And the way I've put it is, there is a real latent demand for reason. Um, and there's a real latent demand for civility and decency but right now, it's hard to find the national movement or the infrastructure or the leaders of such a movement. That, that Those yeah. people are harder to find, but the demand is there. And if there is any sort of hope, I would say one thing that America is usually pretty good at is finding a supply to meet a demand. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that's that's one of the things that our whole culture is kind of built around is finding a supply to meet a demand. And there is a demand for a different kind of politics. Mm-hmm. And there's a demand for a different kind of politics on the right. I talk to these folks every day. They're my friends. They're my family members. They want something better. So when there's a demand, I don't know how and where the supply is going to come from. We're trying to do what we can at the dispatch, but we're just one set of voices um, but that demand is out there. And w- so long as that demand is out there, I've still got a lot of hope. Well, I, I hope that you will come back and talk to us again to answer all the other questions we had planned to <laughs> ask. And I think it's been an enlightening conversation. 
And I'm glad that we could end on a sense of hope that we could return to a world that I used to know, that you used to know, and that hopefully someday Victor will get to know. Right now, (laughs) he doesn't. Uh, He has seen the worst. Uh, So thank you so much for sharing your views and your ideas, and we look forward to having you back again. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to do it. Yeah, thank you so much, David. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed David French and found him enlightening. You can find him again on The Dispatch or on The Atlantic or on Twitter. We hope that you'll tune in next week for another episode of iGen Politics, wherever you follow your podcasts. And subscribe to us on YouTube and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It's important that you do that so that other people can find this podcast. And subscribing is free, so please join us so that you don't miss another episode of iGen Politics.